Web 2.0. Innovation. Trend. Collaboration. Software. Got the world turning as fast as it can? Hear how technology can help, legally speaking, with two of the top legal technology experts, authors, and lawyers, Dennis Kennedy and Tom Mile. Welcome to the Kennedy Mile Report here on the Legal Talk Network. And welcome to episode 174 of the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy in St. Louis. And I'm Tom Mile in Dallas. In our last episode, we discussed whether vacations from technology might be a good thing. Well, maybe not for me, because I was already complaining to Tom about technologies I wished already existed, or if they did exist, someone would just point them out to me. Tom, what's all on our agenda for this episode? Well, Dennis, in this edition of the Kennedy Mall Report, we're going to be sharing our lists and our thoughts on the ways that uh, technology is currently failing us, either personally or as lawyers, uh, and the things we think could be done to improve it. In our second segment, we uh, ponder the very serious topic of why people are freaking out that the iPhone 7 might not come with a headphone jack. And as usual, we'll finish up with our parting shots, that one tip, website, or observation that you can start to use the second this podcast is over. But first, we want to take a look at, I guess we're going to call our technology wish lists. And it's not a wish list that we would do around the holidays. It's a little bit different. Dennis, I think you've found another esoteric topic that makes me really think hard to come up with something literate to say. Uh, You, on the other hand, are a big complainer and apparently have tons of ideas about how technology can be better than it is right now. Um, Why don't you give it a start and, and tell us why isn't technology today good enough for you? Well, just a comment because I I was uh, I got a laugh out of this topic because I suggested to you as like this totally simple topic and and uh, if our audience knew you they would know that I could suggest a, a topic something like the impact of the second law of thermodynamics on records archiving and retrieval and you go like fine we'll re- record it I on can the normal that. day yeah that's no problem and then on this one I'm going like hey let's just come up with things like of technology that we wished uh, existed and you're like whoa whoa I need an extra day we can't record when we thought I need an extra day to prepare so that was kind of funny and I, I just saw it as like a real simple idea and, and the reason that that I, I thought about this topic was I was uh, driving the other morning to work and it's crazy out there. And I was watching the people in front of me and the highway was jammed uh, with people going, well, let's say 70 miles an hour. And generally I would say maybe like between one and three car lengths between each other and people just making shockingly aggressive lane changes and moves um, that were disturbing to me. But on the other hand, were distracting me f- from the guy who was uh, camped out about half a car length behind my my back bumper. And people may know I was in a car crash a couple of years ago, so I'm being in driving does make me nervous. But I I was sort of it made me think like, well, maybe maybe the time of the self driving car really should be here because. I'm fighting the urge just to pull off the road and curl up in a little ball and wait till the traffic dies down a little bit. But the self-driving cars have to be, even at this point, have to be doing a better job than what I see out on the highway. So so I think that we, we're we definitely getting closer to the self-driving thing, but I'm, I'm really intrigued by that. And when I look back, I was thinking about this topic, and we're always seeing some of the self-driving things, and I'm all aboard on this. And, and I see more articles about lawyers thinking about self-driving cars, and of course, they're about, like, who's the liability? Who's going to be responsible for this? How does insurance work? Who's going to be sued? You know, all those and really esoteric uh, questions. I'm like, God, it just has to be safer out there. I'm all, all in on the, the self-driving car. And in my own crash, I was thinking about that. And the uh, so I remember most vividly from the police report was the driver who hit me said, I reached down for my coffee, and the next thing I knew, uh, she was talking about my car, was spinning across the road in front of her. And I spun across four lanes of the highway and hit the concrete median. Unfortunately, it was okay, except for being anxious about ever driving again. But I realized with the safety technology today, with the sort of front-facing radar, the lane, uh, you know, the the uh, sensor that to let you know that you're going out of your lane, and the braking that, that can happen automatically, 
I don't think my accident would actually have happened with current safety. I think I'm really bullish on the the self-driving car and also the, the evolution to it, which are, are these new safety devices. Now, Tom, as I recall, you have this uh, a newer car than mine, and you have a ton of these safety features. And I think uh, for you, it's it's already starting to change the way that you drive. Well, I will say, I don't know that my car is newer than yours, and I will say that it has some of the safety features that you mentioned, um, but the car I drive is certainly not new enough to have the front-facing radar. Um, I've been in cars where if the car tends to drift to the other lane, um, I- I've seen it happen in two different ways. I've seen the, the either sound go off or something on the dashboard, or um, the one that's kind of most kind of uh, kind of jarring is your seat vibrate. And um, you wonder why the heck the seat is vibrating until you realize you're drifting to the other lane. Um, I think all of those are good steps forward and ways that can help safety. I think that the self-driving car, I think the stories that you're seeing, just as we're recording this week, there have been stories, uh, whether we believe them is true or not, but we have, uh, I, I think, two different stories of people who have either had a heart attack or some other type of medical problem and have used their self-driving Tesla or some other car that has self-driving features to help navigate them and uh, and help them get to the hospital. So I think that we're looking at uh, a bunch of different ways in which the new technology for automobiles is going to be helpful in, in a number of ways. So I'm, I'm bullish on that too. I think that the whole notion of the self-driving car uh, is something that um, to me is a little bit uh, analogous to the idea of auto classification or of predictive coding that we have to get used to the idea that computers can do things as well or better as humans and and driving may be one of the last places where that happens. So I I still think that it's an idea that will take a while to to catch on, but I am encouraged by all of that. So Dennis, why don't you uh, try another item from your wish list? And let me back up and say, this is difficult for me because I, not because I am thinking about things that can uh, help with, uh, with, you know, the ways that I think that technology can be better. It's just that I don't think about it in the moment. It's rather, I do think about it in the moment. I don't think about it. I can't just on demand say, well, here's the list of things that I've been thinking about. Um, so, uh, so for the listeners out there, you will notice a decided difference that my stuff tends towards the personal. Dennis, this is actually reaching and stretching out there to how it's useful to the legal industry as a whole. So um, we're kind of doing the micro and the macro as part of our uh, our wish list items. So Dennis, what do you got next? Okay, so my next thing is I, I don't know whether it's sliders or uh, you know little dial buttons, but I love the idea of recommendation engines. So from Amazon to uh, LinkedIn, people you may know. Uh, all sorts of things like that. I love when people say, if you if you like this, you'll also like that. Or if you bought this, here are some other things. Or my library will go, here's some other books that you might like because you do that. And to me, that's like the the coolest idea, you know, that without having to think about it, if, if somebody said, oh, you know, you read these books by this author, here are these other books that uh, people like you would also want to read. And so the promise of it is so great, but the reality of it is I always end up scratching my head. You know, I'm like, wait a second. So recently, without getting too personal here, but uh, for travel, uh, a lot of people uh, like the ex officio underwear, which which are really great for travel. They they dry out really quickly, you know, blah, blah, blah. You, you read the ads. Um, so I ordered some for my wife before a trip. And uh, f- the next time I went on to Amazon and checked the recommendations, uh, 20 of the first 25 recommendations for me were women's underwear. So that's not exactly what I wanted. I mean, I made a gift. And then sometimes you see recommendations where you know, buy a TV and then the next set of recommendations are uh, like a bunch of other TVs. You go like, I, I just bought my TV. So what, what I would like to do is to have this way to, 
to really calibrate this stuff, to say, hey, this was a gift, so let's dial it down and let's dial this up so I can make the adjustments in those recommendations. And I see that like in, in LinkedIn, like I said, the people you may know, I would like to say, I noticed that you there's a little bit of focus on who I've connected to recently as opposed to, to people I've been connected to for a long time. Maybe I can dial those settings a little bit. And so the notion of like, it should be like an easy thing, like a slider or a dial to kind of fine tune that so recommendation engines can achieve the promise that I think they have and that people have always talked about. But in reality, uh, you know, it seems like they ultimately disappoint you these days. Well, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat off of yours and 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 basically say that my wish list for this is similar to what you say is I wish that recommendations would work the way that I think they ought to work and I'll I'll use I'll use three examples where I think that the results are much more disappointing than the promise and and, and frankly Amazon is the first you you had it but for me I think it should be a really simple matter um, for a recommendation engine to be able to I mean you've got all this information on me already. You should be able to look at my purchase history, and and it happens all the time. I go and I look at, um, I go and look at about. I'm, I'm researching a particular technology gadget that I want to get. I look at five or six of them. I choose one. I buy it, and then the next week, my recommendations on Amazon are all the same things that I looked at before. If you're interested in this, maybe you're still interested in it. Well, no, I bought one, and you ought to be able to know that I bought one from the purchase history. So I, I don't see why that wouldn't be a hard fix to make. TripAdvisor uh, is another one. Whenever I want to check out a hotel, I go uh, on TripAdvisor just to kind of see what the ratings are, look at some photos that people have taken, going to learn more about it. And I will tell you that I probably get three or four emails from TripAdvisor saying, time to make a reservation at that hotel you're interested in. And I think it, it assumes too much from what we see. Um, I think there is another failure of recommendation engines. Um, the the final one, and I know I'm kind of cutting close to the bone here, Dennis, but um, you and I have had offline conversations about um, about LinkedIn, and the, and when you try to add people to your network, that people you may know, I look at my list, and sure enough, I know all of them, but it doesn't go far enough to say these are the people that are in industries that I want to connect in. And, um, you know, it might be that I know the administrative assistant of a lawyer that I used to practice with 20 years ago, but I don't necessarily need to be connected with her, or at least it doesn't benefit me in the near term to, to connect with her on LinkedIn. And so having that dial feature um, to say, hey, I want to connect more with people in this industry or less with people in this industry or find some way to fine tune it, I think is a logical step in the next you know, generation of, of recommendation engines. Yeah. And as you talk about it, my notion of the dialing in could also be like just a uh, direction on criteria. So if I'm on Amazon, I only want recommendations that are four star or above, or that it's one of the, the three highest rated or one of the three most popular of its type. That to me is way more useful than uh, that would be more important to me than it that might be to other people. So my next one is uh, a longtime wish of mine, which is what I call a really great social media dashboard. And as I thought about this, I realized that some of my wish list is really almost close to Dennis needs to learn how to program and to do some scripting uh, because because I want to really personalize a lot of things and have some functionality that that maybe there isn't a tool is it's uncommon enough that there won't be a tool that works so here's my idea of a social media dashboard would work in two ways so one is it's one screen that would pull in all the feeds from all the different social media and allow me to act on those. And, and there are tools out there that do that. But sort of more important to me is I would like to have the dashboard for what I put out into social media. And in a way, this is a content management system, but I would like to say what I want to do is I want to write my blog post and then I, I want to have it set up in a way that all the things I want to do in connection with that blog post can happen. 
And so maybe I have a way of writing, it would be XML tags, frankly, but, but I might have a dashboard that said, here's the blog post itself, here's like a short description, here's a way to grab the description plus a graphic, you know, that sort of thing. And then I could say, and then maybe some timing tools as well, and I could say, okay, when the blog post goes out, I have it set up so like once it hits my RSS feed, then just the short description goes out to Twitter, the short description plus a picture goes over to Facebook or LinkedIn, and these other things happen and it all takes place in one setting and I don't have to do these separate things or I don't have to figure out with some sort of script or automation. And I think there are, you know, we, we've talked about if this and that and other things like that. I think there are ways to make this happen, but it sort of reminds me of you know, people who tell you, oh, this is easy to do this. Like, we're, you know, it's like old word, perfect five one. This is easy to do this. It's a little control F8 here. You know, you do this and then it's a shift, you know, a shift control F7 and boom, you have it. And I just sort of want to have the all-in-one dashboard that reflects my actual behavior in, in social media and especially in getting posts out to multiple, uh, multiple outlets. Well, I think um, this may not be helpful to you, but those people who use WordPress blogs, there are so many different add-ins, many of which may do exactly what you're talking about. I know that my, I will say, little used blog, um, I do have a WordPress blog that has a plug-in for Twitter so that every time I, I have a post publish, whether I publish it immediately or whether I schedule it to post at another time, um, then it posts automatically to Twitter that I've got a new post and uh, and I can customize how I want that to uh, how it be seen. So uh, I, I would imagine that with a little research, you may find that there that someone may be coming up with that. Now, should that be part of the, the WordPress platform to begin with, or should it be something that someone else is coming up with as kind of an all-in-one package? I think that's probably a good question. My next one is a wish list item that I think a lot of people have, and, and, I'm, and it may sound like I'm being unfair when I start it, but my wish list is that I want voice recognition to get good. And when I mean good, I mean really good, and I want it to be smart. To be fair, and I guess I should qualify and say there is some voice recognition out there that's really good. Some of the things I'm going to talk about in a second are really good. Dragon dictation. If you use dragon dictation um, to dictate letters or to do things, it's really good. It can learn. Um, it has good accuracy when you want to dictate. But I think what I'm thinking of is not just voice recognition for the purpose of, of being able to capture what you have to say and, and put it in a text message or an email or a document or something like that. I want to talk about voice recognition for services that are actually going to act on that information and do something about it. I'm talking about Siri and Google Now and Amazon Echo, and there's no question that their voice recognition is better than it used to be, but I still think that it's hit and miss. You know, I, I use my Amazon Echo as an example. There are times when it kind of hears only what it wants to hear or that it only has a certain way of responding. And I think that part of that's a problem with the smartness of the tool. They're pretty smart, but I want them to be smarter. And I'll give my example about the Echo. I, I frequently use the Amazon Echo to reorder things that I've previously bought um, on Amazon. And one of these is a is a particular skincare product that I use. I buy it in bulk uh, because I don't need to I don't need to go buy it at the store. And it's very simple process. And usually I can just say to the Echo, please reorder this. It asks, it confirms it. I say yes and it says order placed. Well lately it tried to give me the wrong product and then when I if I told them that wasn't the right one, the next one that it tried to give me was actually a book with the name of the product in it. And it was a fictional book, uh, a young adult fictional book, which was not relevant at all. And, and I found out later that the product that I was trying to order was out of stock. Uh, it wasn't available at all. And this is my wish list here. How hard would it be for Amazon to configure the Echo so that it would say, you know, this item is current, the item that you ordered in the past is currently out of stock. Would you like to order from a different source or something like that? I think that that it's it doesn't go far enough in being smart. Uh, you know, I, I, I like how 
smart Google Now has gotten, where you can ask it to say, who is the 40th president of the United States? And then, and then once it answers you with Ronald Reagan, all you have to do is say, where did he go to college? And it will pick up the context of that and answer that question. I know we've talked about this in the podcast before, but this is where I think I'd really like to see the Amazon pick up its game and, and, and get smarter about things. And, and to a certain extent, all voice recognition be able to, to not only understand uh, the words that I'm saying, but also the context of what I'm saying. Yeah, I think you're right on with that one. I think we, let's do a little lightning round here. But uh, so I have another sort of dashboard notion. But I, and this comes up, Tom, you and I were trying to find, I guess it was the page proofs for our collaboration book. And we realized that although they probably exist somewhere, that we weren't able to put our hands on it. And so you realize that, I'm thinking, did we do that stuff in Google Docs? Is that in. G, do I have a copy somewhere in Gmail that was sent to me? Is that in Dropbox? Is that on like an archive somewhere or is it on a different computer? And so I was thinking, you know what would be great is if there were a better way that I could look across all the places that I, I might store things, especially the Dropboxes, the Google Drives, the iCloud, all those sorts of things, in addition to my backups and and the local drives as well. As it turns out, I was talking to one of my friends at a company called Latera uh, that I've always liked, and they're actually doing this uh, that you can do in a business setting with some really cool controls where you can, you can look and you can find documents that are both local and in the standard cloud drives. The tool is called Ekta, E-K-T-A. And they're going to do an individual version as well. But I think in a business setting, uh, it's kind of interesting because then I think you can drive your users to certain, uh, say, Dropbox or other of these shared drive tools that you trust or that you like or you can kind of minimize and then people can see everything in one place. And then you as a firm have control over what's there. So it's, it's kind of a cool thing where people are starting to, to bring into being the idea I have, which is, is a Again, sort of a dashboard for all, all my files, no matter where they're located. Yeah, my next is maybe less technology and more just clothing. Um, I, I am, am starting, and we're going to talk in our second segment a little bit about wireless headphones, but I find it very difficult to find a pair of wireless earbuds that actually fit. And maybe this is a very personal item on my wish list, but I've got to say, I cannot find earbuds that will fit my ear. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I will say that one earbud fits just fine. The other one feels like it's going to fall out. That's an issue with my anatomy that I can't fix. But I find that I'm usually going to the largest one and it never fits. It's always falling out. And it seems to me that, you know, there are high-end companies out there that will actually create a mold of your ear. They'll custom fit earbuds to your liking. Maybe it is hard to do that and mass produce it and have it to, to where it's something that you could buy. But I'd pay a couple hundred bucks for a good quality earbud to be that custom fit to have. As it is, I either get good quality earbuds that don't fit or I get low quality earbuds that are custom fit. I kind of would like them to meet somewhere in the middle and uh, I just want to have some wireless earbuds that fit. Yeah, I, I sort of think the custom things are more in the $1,000 range these days. That's still. true. And boy, you'd hate to leave those on a plane or somewhere, you know, which is, is sort of the tendency on, on earbuds anyway. My other one, you know, relates back to the other thing. And, and again, this is something like where maybe the answer is Dennis needs to learn to code a little bit. But obviously, I don't have the time to do that. Uh, but I want super simple data analytics tools. And this could be another WordPerfect 5.1 thing where people say, oh, all you need to do is to go into Google Analytics and do this and go down to this page and do these things and pull these things and pull it out into a spreadsheet. But what I, I would like to know is to, you know, just simple analytics, you know, like so if I'm on LinkedIn, I want to know, like, if I send out invitations, how many of those come back, you know, can I measure something like a success rate? Uh, can I map that over time on my email? Are, are, might there are things I want to map out or analyze? Uh, I was interested the other day of, like, maybe I could rate some of the different companies about how many times I have to actually push unsubscribe before the emails stop coming to me. 
and Condé Nast, you know who you are. I think that uh, number has to be somewhere around infinity. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to shut those off. But I think that kind of simple data analytics tool that I can turn on some of the things that I have. And we talked about a little bit about this time when we did the machine learning on, on a very simple basis. But it'd be nice to do some of that for, for things we do on a, a regular basis where it'd just be kind of nice to get some idea of numbers. The next item on my list is more tablet or touch versions of legal apps. I'm still amazed at the legal software developers that either don't have their own tablet app um, or even an app that is touch enabled. Uh, you know, we're moving, if we aren't already there, we're moving very quickly toward a mobile first user preference. And I just don't think that a lot of the soft legal software providers are doing a great job of keeping up with that. I think it, it took most of the cloud-based practice management providers years to come out with an iPad app. I kept asking, where's the iPad app? Where is it? I think that people are using mobile devices more often, iPads or phones. And I think the e-discovery industry is another area where apps are sparse. Some review platforms have their own apps, but you have to be a customer of that company to use them. The ability to conduct a document review on a tablet or just to check on the status of a review on your phone, I think is something that a lot of e-discovery lawyers would like to have a little bit more ability to do. And I think that the tools out there are just either too few and far between or too limited. I think some of the tools, the ones that are out there actually are quite good, but you have to, again, be a customer of that company. I'd like to see more start to develop uh, tools for their own services. And my last one, I, which I realize now may be the perfect lead-in to our next segment, is uh, because I, I may be talking about something that will soon be obsolete, but I use a DVR, um, and so I sort of capture programs and watch it in, in the way people normally do with DVRs. And the thing that's always bothered me is that I know there's certain movies I'd like to grab or certain shows, and I sort of have this, what I call like a 12-day time frame that I can set things out. So I may see that a show's coming out uh, say like at the like in a month or two and then I have to remember to do that or there might be some movie and I just like to have this wish list and then if it ever showed up where it could be recorded the DVR would just record it as I'm saying this and I was thinking about this I realized that ultimately the answer is going to be like why are you using a DVR you just need a wish list and with an on-demand service and then just pick whatever you whatever you want. And so that issue may, may go away. But that is one that's always frustrated me because it would just be nice to have that already in place so I don't have to fool with it. Yeah, I was going to give you two words, either Apple TV or Roku. Um, although that's three words, I guess. A anyway, my, my, my last one, I'll go very quickly because this wish list is something that I imagine a lot of people have, and that's really the elimination of passwords. And, and this is more than just a technology wish list item, but it's been a little bit more um, in the news lately in that one of the password managers out there, Dashlane, uh, has entered into some type of partnership with Google um, to do what they call YOLO. Uh, you may think that is you only live once, but it really, in this, in this context, means you only log in once and they're hoping to get other password managers um, on board. Not sure exactly what that is, but the goal is to try and make passwords easier. Uh, Google's also working on something they call the Trust API, um, which is a way of using a combination of factors. You know, not just your fingerprint, not just your retina, but your location and facial recognition, um, your typing patterns, how you hold the phone, things like that that in combination determine your identity and you'd get a trust score depending on what it was you were trying to log into, like a banking uh, website or app would have a much higher trust score than other things. Um, I'm really interested to see where this goes. I know that it's going to be hard to get rid of passwords, but at least making them easier, I think, should be a goal of both um, the software developers as well as some of these platforms that we're having to use passwords on. And to put in a good word for my employer, MasterCard, watch what we're doing these days in that space. So let's wrap it up, Tom. I, I think there was actually a lot more to talk about there and maybe some, some topics we can revisit in, in the future. I think so, too. If any of you out there listening have anything on your wish list, give us a holler. We'll give you the contact information at the end of the podcast. Give us a holler, and we'll try to mention it on an upcoming episode. Uh, but before we move on to our next segment, let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsor. Looking for a process server you can trust? ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local pre-screen process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry. 
Connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre screened process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. And now let's get back to the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. Tom suggested, as you know, that we talk about the big, and I mean big, negative reaction to rumors of Apple's iPhone 7s not having a physical earphone jack. And I just saw a blog post today where where people were talking about how tremendous the negative reaction was. Well, when Tom mentioned this topic to me, I actually laughed out loud and uh, took off my Bluetooth headphones uh, that I was wearing to think about it. Uh I think it... I I think it is a serious topic for many. I think on a faster pace than ever before, traditional technologies do disappear. Tom, would you hand me a floppy disk, please? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to make you laugh tonight, I can tell. (laughs) Is this an an important development or just another sign of things to come that people are just going to have to get used to and then realize after a very short time they don't even miss it? So I think laugh all you want, Dennis, but I will take you back to a time, what's it been, two years, two years, three years, um, when Google Reader went away. And uh, the despondence that I felt emanating from you was palpable. And I bet you don't even miss it now, although that may be a subject of a further podcast or a further B segment. But to catch everybody up real quick, um, the iPhone 7 is scheduled to come out to ship in September, maybe October. And the rumor mill has been very hot and heavy that it will come without a headphone jack. The thought is that it will come with earbuds that either fit into the lightning port of your phone or maybe earbuds and a dongle. The regular earbuds fit into the dongle. The dongle fits into your lightning port. What would be clear is that you probably could no longer listen to something and charge your phone at the same time unless you invest in some form of Bluetooth wireless speakers. Um, there's been a lot of uproar about this. Believe it or not, uh, you know, a couple obvious complaints. The Bluetooth headphones are good. They're not great. Um, I think think that they still could could be better. You may now have to buy headphones that only work on the iPhone and don't work on anything else, which may or may not be a problem for you. And then finally, the other complaint is, is anybody really asking for this? Is this more of a just an Apple grab that they want to grab? And, and I will say that the real issue, Dennis, is what you identified at the outset. No matter how much there is an out, uh, uproar about this, technology changes. We either have to change with it or give up the technology or, or, or do find another alternative to what we're doing. You and I both had to find alternatives to Google Reader. I don't know about you. I've been happy with the change that I've made, and I don't know or remember Google Reader that much anymore. I made a smooth transition from the floppy disk to the USB drive to cloud services, and I think Apple has made a fortune making changes that nobody asked for. So I think embracing the change is not a bad thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's interesting to look through all the things that we thought were so essential that uh, now seem irrelevant are things we just are trying to get rid of, you know, CDs, DVDs, uh, you know, all those sorts of things were really important at the time. So I, I think the headphone thing is, is sort of interesting to me. And I, I think, you know, one reason people do complain is especially people who spend hundreds of dollars on really nice headphones. But typically, if you're doing that, you're probably not listening to MP3s on an iPhone anyway. So there are some issues there about what you already have invested. It seems like every new technology, there's going to be an adapter. So that doesn't really seem like a a big concern of mine. I think the move is toward Bluetooth, and it is really nice wearing Bluetooth headphones um, because they don't get tangled up. You don't get caught on something if uh you know you're riding a bike or something i mean the headphone wires or the earbud wires can be a real problem if you're riding a bike uh so those are all good i would say the downside of bluetooth headphones super easy to misplace and lose but you know we all learn how to do that what's kind of more interesting to me and i don't know enough about at this point 
But it's the use of the lightning port that is really interesting to me because I think it allows more things to happen with the headphones. And I sort of have always conceived of Apple's Beats purchase as the headphones being like the second piece of wearables, you know, after the watch. And so using that lightning connector may allow more things to happen through earphones, headphones, earbuds. Um, and so as a platform, it may make things really interesting, whereas that the old earphone jack pretty much does what it does. Now it's time for our parting shots, that one tip website or observation you can use the second this podcast ends. Tom, take it away. So my parting shot is a little frivolous this week, but it is an app that has kind of, it started out with uh, iOS and has now moved over to Android. And um, I think that the hype is justified. I, uh, I've i always looked at apps for your photos that can apply a filter to it. I've looked at them very skeptically that, you know, making something look like vintage or like a grunge photo really didn't do a lot for me. But uh, there's a relatively new app out there called Prisma, P-R-I-S-M-A. And Prisma actually will turn your photo into artwork, uh, depending on the style you want, whether you want to have it as an impressionist painting or you want it something more modern. Um, and it really does some interesting things with the pictures that you have. I've seen people post pictures that are just beautiful um, as paintings. And uh, it's a really interesting app with lots of filters that uh, can do amazing things with your photos. There's another app out there I have not tried called Artisto, A-R-T-I-S-T-O, that will uh, claims to do the same thing with your videos, will make it like a cartoon, uh, something similar to that. But uh, either of them, if you want to have a little bit of fun with your photos, Prisma or Artisto are, I think, definitely worth a download. And I downloaded it this week, although I haven't had the opportunity to, to try it yet. So... Um, Interesting development for me in 2016 is the email newsletter. And so I'm really fond of an email newsletter called Farnham Street. And then our friends, I like to call them our friends because we talk about them all the time and, and read the site all the time, Cool Tools, have started an email newsletter. And the idea is they're did sort of like six things. And I actually think I got the recommendation for Prisma out of Recommendo, uh, which is the name of their newsletter, email newsletter, R-E-C-O-M-E-N-D-O. And it's just kind of a, a nice, you know, six short paragraphs of some, some interesting tools in different categories and things to read, think about, try. And uh Actually, a very nice use of the email newsletter format after a time where I would have thought it was dead. And, you know, even though I find myself very skeptical about the idea of email newsletters coming back, I raced right out and subscribed to Recommendo and look forward to, to getting it and getting more information from them. So... That wraps it up for this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. You can find the show notes for this episode at tkmreport.com. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes or on the Legal Talk Network site, where you can find archives of all of our previous podcasts as well. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please email us at tkmreport at gmail.com or send us a tweet. I'm at Tom Mile and Dennis is at Dennis Kennedy. So until the next podcast, I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy, and you've been listening to the Kennedy Mile Report, a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus. Help us out by telling a couple of your friends and colleagues about the podcast. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Mile Report. Check out Dennis and Tom's book, The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together, from ABA Books or Amazon. And join us every other week for another edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, only on the Legal Talk Network.